will be the current in it, which is IR must be calculated times XC and so on. Let's do that. So, we have all these. The voltage across BC is the voltage drop across the resistor. VBC is IRMS times R, which is 100.5 volts. The voltage across CD is the potential drop across the inductor, which is VCD is IRMS times the inductive reactants. We have those values. Similarly, the voltage across AD is the potential drop across the capacitor. VAD is IRMS times the reactance of the capacitor. We have all those values. And finally, the potential drop across BD the potential drop across BD is the potential drop across a series combination of the resistor and the inductor. Of course, there you got to calculate the total impedance. Since the potential drop across the inductor is 90 degrees out of phase with across the resistor, they are at right angles to each other and the resultant voltage therefore is, well, VR is 100.5 volts, that is the potential drop across the resistor we calculated and the potential drop across the inductor we know VCD is 101 volts and these two are at right angles. Therefore, the potential drop across BD will be the resultant there and VBD will be VBC squared plus VCD squared and that will be 141.8 volts. I think you probably need to look at this one more time. All right, we will now see another application of electromagnetic induction. In the last lesson I told you if the current in a coil of wire is either growing or decaying. The associated change in magnetic flux can actually induce an EMF in another coil of wire. Now what happens if I allow an AC to pass through this coil? Remember an AC is continuously changing. It is growing, decaying, growing, decaying at a tremendous rate, about 60 times a second. Now, if I have another coil inside the first coil and we use an iron core to magnify the magnetic field, then the magnetic flux linked with this will be continuously changing and we would expect an EMF and hence a current to be induced in here. If you notice, I have connected this coil, which I'm going to call the secondary coil, to a light bulb. And the light bulb will tell you if there is a current in it or not. This is the primary coil I'm going to connect it to an AC and uh, see what happens. I'm going to put this secondary coil in there and see if anything happens when I connect it. Look at this. The light bulb is lighting up. That means the continuously changing magnetic field produced by the AC is actually inducing an EMF. You see, this is not connected to the power supply. And you can see if I withdraw it, the magnetic flux linked with that coil decreases and the induced EMF also decreases. Now, this is the principle of a transformer. So, we will quickly talk about that before we close lesson today. So the transformer consists of an iron core on which one coil of wire is connected to an AC source and another coil of wire can be connected to a bulb or a galvanometer. When the AC is turned on in the first coil and AC is generated in the second coil, the changing magnetic flux produced by the AC in the first coil will induce an EMF in the second coil. 
Now, the changing magnetic flux produced by the AC is responsible for that induced EMF. Now, an alternating current flowing in the top coil will result in the production of an alternating current in the bottom coil. Now, the top coil is called the primary coil and the bottom one is called the secondary coil. So, the, a transformer has a primary coil and a secondary coil. Now, suppose N1 is the number of turns in the primary and E1 is the input voltage. Is that right? That's the input voltage. And if N2 is the number of turns in the secondary and E2 is the output voltage. So for a transformer there's an input voltage and an output voltage. Now there's a relation connecting E1, E2, N1 and N2. And I'll give you that relation in a, in a while. The transformer is represented by this symbol in an electrical circuit. Now, a relation between E1, E2, N1 and N2 is E1 divided by E2 equal to N1 divided by N2. Very simple relation. Now, that means you can either have a step-down transformer or a step-up transformer. Now, if N2 is less than N1, the number of turns in the secondary is less than the number of turns in the primary, then the output voltage will be less than the input voltage. That means from a high voltage AC, you can obtain a lower voltage AC. So this is a high voltage AC and the output is a low voltage AC. This kind of a transformer is called a step-down transformer. <coughs> now what is therefore a step-up transformer? If N2, the primary number of windings, I'm sorry, the secondary number of windings is greater than the primary number of windings, then the secondary voltage or the output voltage will be greater than the input voltage. So here we have a primary coil which the number of turns, the secondary coil has a greater number of turns. In this case you get a bigger output across the secondary and such a transformer is a step-up transformer. You can actually use a low voltage AC and obtain a high voltage AC. Now, but we can get an output voltage that is greater than the input voltage. Does it mean that the transformer is creating energy? Well, the total energy cannot change. So, the input power and the output power, in fact, the output power can never be greater than the input power. If E1 and E2 are the primary and secondary voltages, and I1 and I2 are the primary and secondary currents, then we have the maximum we can have is E1 I1 equal to E2 I2, the input power equal to the output power. But in practice, some power is lost in the transformer in the form of heat and sound. So this will not be in practice, this is ideal. Now this means that for a step-down transformer, when E2 becomes less than E1, I2 will be greater. For a step-down transformer, the output current will be greater than the input current, when the output voltage is less than the input voltage. Similarly, for a step-up transformer, when you step up the voltage, you step down the current. You can't have uh, both. Uh, step up at the same time. Now transformers are very useful in transmitting power over distances. Now in the power plant electricity is generated at say about 15,000 or 20,000 volt. And now it is stepped up into say 400,000 volts and here is the high tension voltage. It then comes to the distribution where you have a step-down transformer which steps it down to about 4,000 volts which is the line that comes to your house. 
Um, outside your house, always there is a transformer, a step-down transformer, which steps down that 4,000 volts to 120 volts so that you can use them. So all these are very important applications of electromagnetic induction. All right. So on the phone pole next to your home, the 13 kV, actually the line that comes to your home is a 13 kilovolt, which is stepped down to 120 or 240. In fact, there are both these that are the outputs for your transformer. Let's do a problem. A doorbell works on a 6 volt supply and it takes in 0.5 ampere when operating. A step down transformer with 2,500 turns in the primary is used to step down the 120 volts to 6 volts. It's very commonly used in homes. What is the number of turns required for the secondary coil? What is the current in the secondary coil? Well, we have E1, the primary voltage, E2, the secondary voltage, N1, the primary windings, and I1, the primary current. We have E1 over E2 equal to N1 over N2, and that gives you N2 equal to E2 N1 over E1, and that will be 125 terms. And then E1 I1 equal to E2 I2, and that will give you I2, the output current or the secondary current is E1 I1 over E2, which is 10 ampere. Well, that's a very simple problem, and uh, you can actually see problems like this you know, uh, applications of this uh, in 